parts in the right place, but you're not quite sure exactly what we're supposed to do, welcome to the club. We kind of know in our hearts that, that doing something here is right. Um, a lot of us, myself first and foremost, don't know what to do, don't know how to talk about it, don't know what steps to take. So that's what I hope we can, we can talk about a little bit today. And, and I, I found my discussions with, with Andy particularly refreshing in that, in that respect. He's got a, a realistic but positive attitude about what we can do. So I'd like to introduce Andy a little more formally than was done in the promotional material I sent, sent out. Um, he sent me his, his bio and I said, no, we've got to cut that down. How about 25 words? And because uh, <laughs> I know my, my cohort won't read more than 25 words, but I'm going to force you to listen to some of this uh, because it's, it's relevant and it's impressive. He, he's had years of experience as an executive and advisor to leaders in business, government, and, and the, in the nonprofit sector. And he works with leaders in privately held and publicly traded companies. He was the president of the Alliance for Business Leadership, working closely with CEOs on sharpening their impact by aligning strategy and core values. Uh, he's a veteran civil rights attorney and advocate. And this uncommon uh, combination has prepared him uniquely to handle these candid and, and practical discussions uh, in this unprecedented moment of racial reckoning and public scrutiny. He also served as the president of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate and as executive director of the Anti-Defamation League of New England. In addition, he served as the senior vice president for strategy and business development with Everseat, which is a healthcare, healthcare IT company. Uh, early in his career, he was a trial attorney in the civil rights division of the U.S. Department of Justice, and he received the NAACP's Kivi Kaplan Humanitarian Award and the Max Mickelson Humanitarian Award from the Jewish Family Service of Metro West Boston. He's been in various roles in public service by uh, both the Democratic and Republican governors of Massachusetts, and he's a trustee of the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology and a strategic advisor with Boston's Foundation for business equity. In 2020, Andy and two partners co-founded Conscious Customers LLC to help businesses put Black, Latin, and women-owned led companies at the center of their spending. And um, it's with that background that, uh, and the fact that he's a very uh, eloquent speaker and, and thinker uh, that brings him to us. So uh, enjoy the program. Uh, Andy, I think at the, at the end, I, I hope there will be time for, uh, for Q&A. I think this is a, a topic that will raise lots of questions as you go along. Uh, you can tell us whether you'd like to entertain the questions uh, during the presentation or at the end. I'd probably recommend at the end, otherwise you won't get through anything, but uh, that's up to you. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Scott, for for that introduction and the um, and the uh, reminder that this is a discussion we need to have. So um, I did prepare some content. I did violate the rule I was um, given once that was you never need more than eight slides, but a lot of them are just prompts. They're not. I'm not going to read you the phone book today. Um, <laughs> we don't. We don't. We don't have time for that. Um, but good morning. And if you're in, uh, in the position that Scott, I think so aptly described, which is that your heart's in the right place, but you're not quite sure exactly what we're supposed to do, welcome to the club. Um, my, uh, in, in the moments before we all came on, I did, men I did sort of say, I hope the world is a bell curve. I am not a statistician, but I've been saying for years that in the bell curve of the world at the leading edge is all the fabulous people we can applaud right now who don't need our help. They've got it. All right, way out here, fabulous, nice job. Way out at the back are the laggards. And I used to be in the Justice Department and we'd have to go and, and talk to them. You know, they were really, they were really ignoring key uh, topics that we've legislated about. In the middle is all the rest of us. 
And some of us are a little bit ahead of the other on one topic and a little behind on another. And welcome to the club. I often tell people, and I will tell you, that I think of camping when I think of this. Um, I don't know how many of you, give me like a show of hands. Who, who goes camp? Who's ever gone camping, you know, in recent time? Okay, so we got some campers. It's great. My partner, Gloria Velasquez, is here, um, who uh, he's here, heard me say that a bunch of times. And sometimes there's nobody who's gone camping, but okay. So when you go camping, sometimes there's, there's, um, there's usually three kinds of people, right? Because there has to be. But there's one that spends the entire like first two hours trying to make it feel like they're not camping. You know, they got the tablecloth, they're like removing all the rocks, they're sweeping stuff, you know, they brought stuff that you can, that's never been in the woods before because they might need it. Might be you, I see some smirks, there might be you. Then there's the guy who gets out of the car, rolls a fleece up in a ball and lies down under a tree and he's chewing on a piece of grass. And you're looking, if you're in the third group, you're looking at both of them like they're nuts. Well, the fact is we are in the woods, okay? We're in the woods. You can comb it and brush it as much as you want, but don't tell me I'm supposed to lie down under a tree like that guy and be so at ease with it, because I'm not. I'm right here in the middle, but don't go over on that other side and waste your time trying to make this seem simple because it's not. It's complicated for many, many reasons. And here we are. And the other thing I like to say before I say anything else is I'm a white guy. I won the American Embryonic Lottery, a white male cisgendered heterosexual whose parents went to college and owned their own home where I grew up you basically are doing an end zone dance for the rest of your life when your story starts off that way. And I'm not saying I'm rich or comfortable in ways that you know I, uh, I read about with others, but it starts for me right there. Why am I doing this? Because it needs to be done and because I enjoy it. I have a passion for it and I think I have something to bring. Um, I've been working around this set of topics from a whole bunch of different angles, from enforcement and investigation to management. I've been a CEO of a number of organizations. I've built teams. I've made every mistake that we're going to allude to in this conversation. But I've done some things right that I'm really proud of, too. And, um, and I like to be, um, you know, the same progressive pragmat pragmatist that I feel like I've always been. A lot of us are are very policy or, or intellectually oriented. And some of us are more just driven by personality and our, our, our psychology. I think I'm a little bit of both. Some of this is learned rigor and substance and some of it is just temperament and style. And you're, that's the way it's gonna be. And by the way, that's the same way it is with everything. We could be having a, that same intro right up to that point could be the same one if we were doing a talk today or a discussion today on innovation or adapting new, to new technologies, right? Or, or um, working remote or the modern, the, the, the mysterious millennial or, or, or Gen Z or whatever topic it is. The bottom line is leadership takes all of the above and this is no different. So I'm gonna pop in my, my uh, shared screen and run you through some, some content that I put together. I told Scott already in, 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 at the outset Anyone who wants the deck can have it. It's not one of those decks that is that useful without all of us here. Um, but happy to follow up, would be in fact delighted to follow up with any of you to, to revisit some of it, but it isn't like it's a copy of my notes uh, or anything good like that. And we, we, Scott and I talked a lot about how to frame this topic. And we really thought the business case was at the center of it. But what I added was moving from obligation to excellence. Um, and you'll sort of see why I think of it that way as we go. Um, I mentioned already who we are. You've heard enough about me and us um, and what we do. We help leaders lead. And uh, this is very often at the center of, of, of it. Uh, and I'm proud of that. Um, and we started another company that if there's time, um, Gloria and I can, can talk to you about where we, we saw a particular topic here that gets not enough coverage outside of the Fortune 100, which is procurement. And we focused the whole team just on that, but we'll get back to that. 
Um, so here's the question, and, and what are we going to cover in this period and, uh, of time uh, together? Um, what can I do to improve my company's DEI situation? So we're going to do four things today. Make the business case together. Identify leverage points that are within the span, your span of control. You know, your dashboard people, your leaders. What do I, it's all well and good that the world is a mess, but what do I have on my desk? that I can adjust that can move uh, the needle in, this, in the sphere for which I'm responsible. Uh, I wanna expose you to a framework for action, um, which is the way I approach this work and it's no um, trade secret. It's really kind of simple logic, but uh, the reason I think it, it's helpful to share a framework is to say, is to again, get to the how, you know, to get to the how, it's all well and good. Uh, you, you know, remember the, phrase from the movie, Jerry Maguire, you had me at hello. It's like, yeah, but how? So that's what Scott and I really want to talk about. And then the last is I want to just talk about a shift in, you know, from obligation to opportunity and, and even to excellence. All right. So um, first, some key terms. Can you all see my screen? It's, and it's clear, you can see the terms on here. Um, these definitions are from eclectic sources gathered by my colleague, um, Omari Jai Aarons who's right there, who does a lot of work like this with me. Um, and uh, they're there for you to see, but um, I'm gonna read them out to you. And then we're not gonna be spending a ton of time where you can Google stuff, but there's a reason that we're going through some of these, but I just wanna put them out there as terms. Diversity is the range of human differences. It doesn't have the word race in it or racism in it. Uh, but when you try to define it without that, you're just, you're just playing, you're just, a you're just kidding around. Uh, in this conversation, there are a lot of people, particularly uncomfortable people, white people who like to say, look, diversity is not just about, you know, gender, you know, it's not just about race. I know it's not. In the, and that's a real thing. It's about a lot of, a lot of facets. But let's not kid ourselves. We have a specific history and a specific problem that brings us together. And, um, you know, the, the diversity of insights and styles and you went to University of Chicago and I went to community college is not what we meant by it when we realized we needed to spend an hour on this today. We're talking about some pretty, pretty specific challenges. Uh, but diversity itself is, is a lot of things. Okay. Equity is not the same as equality. Um, equality is treating everybody the same. Equity is providing access to the same opportunities and conditions. You might have a different definition or a favorite one, but the bottom line is it's putting people in a position to access the same. If they don't have a computer at home and you're a teacher or you're a boss making people work remote, telling everybody to work from home on their laptop is not to embrace equity. Equity is to make sure everybody has a laptop. I'm using the dumbest and simplest example that I guarantee you was violated in workplaces and schools all across America all year in the last year. And I hope you know what I'm saying. Equity means, does everybody have a laptop? Equality would mean everybody can work from home. <laughs> um, and, and you can take that and transfer that to every other, every other category, even from running late in meetings. You know, who can afford to pay the late fee at their daycare? Who has in home care at home with a nanny and doesn't even have to think about late fees and who in your meeting that's running over is going, oh my God, we're literally gonna get kicked out of the place if I don't get out of here on time. That's, that's the difference between equality and equity. Everybody got out of the meeting at the same time. I didn't discriminate. Well, you failed to understand the complexity of who's on your team. Um, all right, so just, just something to, to play with. We can argue about all of these. Inclusion, is respect and appreciation for the, for that diversity. It's something you have to create. The fact that you're diverse, you know, um, some of us were talking before everyone got on about studies that show, oh, when, when we add women, we didn't make more money. It's BCG said we were gonna make more money. Inclusion and empowerment is what causes that over time in the right conditions. Diversity is just a fact. They don't, you don't make more money the day they arrive or by the fact that they have taken a test uh, that shows that they have estrogen. Uh, that is not what produces the excellence. 
it's inclusion, effective inclusion in, in a deep, deep way. Uh, not because there are pictures on your website. You guys, you guys know that. Um, justice. This is creeping into the business language. Um, maybe not where you are, but I would love to know if you're seeing it. A lot of consultants uh, are feeling um, more like truth tellers these days and are willing to say to you um, that even, I don't care what Milton Friedman told you about the role of the corporation in, in capitalism, you have an obligation to put goodness and righteousness above self-interest in some situations. And you don't have to argue with me about that, but you do have to negotiate that out with your stakeholders. And that's where we're going next. So these are some terms. There's another term that's really important. Um, and I wanna defer to one of the preeminent geniuses on the topic in America today uh, to, to sort of define one more term and then we'll go get into, into that how stuff. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, read out to you an excerpt from Professor Ibram Kendi at Boston University um, who as the caption indicates has, has achieved a lot of acclaim in this moment in American American uh, evolution. Uh, what's the problem with being not racist? It is a claim that signifies neutrality. I'm not racist, but neither am I aggressively against racism. But there's no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist. It's anti-racist. How many of you just show hands have heard that word anti-racist in recent time? Again, with me, you're not going to see me assuming we were, we're all on the fast bus for this stuff, okay? Um, you know, not everybody's, not everybody's gotten there and some people are seeing corporations from BlackRock on down say we are going to become an anti-racist organization. It's almost like the, the carbon neutral of, of this movement, except that it's 10 years behind in defining its terms. What does that even mean? And a friend of mine who's a very prominent venture capitalist and, and former chief marketing officer of a number of great companies said in a, a tweet sometime last summer when a lot of us were having moments, um, he said, I am 51 years into being not racist and I'm about 15 minutes into deciding that I'm gonna be anti-racist and I'm terrified. And it was just this moment of him saying, I don't even know what that means. But what I think Kendi and the others are talking about with that word is captured in this paragraph. And this is really the part of this where I'm, I'm giving you content. The rest of it's really gonna be um, frameworks uh, and structure. Anti-racism, it's just something you're not gonna take 10 minutes with me and then be, you know, be fluent and, and, and comfortable with all this stuff. But I want you to know that it's business normal now for you to be wrestling with it and to be reading about it and, and to be the one in the room who has been exposed to it before. Uh, to be an anti-racist, it's a form of action against racial hatred, bias, and systemic racism. It's really structured around conscious efforts and deliberate actions. And it's about dismantling. It's about taking things apart. It's, it's the vision to, to understand what happens when you're running late in a meeting and what it does to people's lives, to the idea that, that there are things that are done in your sphere that are not profoundly significant to you, but are meaningful in the lives of your people that are playing out in a way that, that undercuts and disturbs equity dismantling systems um, that have been in place for a long time that on their face may be really benign. And that active posture um, is really hard for a lot of people who have business training, frankly, and who are, who've tried to be sort of apolitical about some of this stuff, because there's this, this notion that colorblindness and neutrality exist. And at least in my opinion, they don't. Um, I'm working really hard to embrace this challenge. And I'm very aware of ways in which I am failing miserably. But I'll tell you the words affirmative action became so politically loaded over the course of my lifetime 
and, and all of a sudden we're going to be like comfortable with deliberate action. It's the same exact expression. One just got associated with a set of tactics that, that are, are misunderstood in some places and maybe well understood and, and disliked in others. But all it was intended to say that term is the same thing that says here, you have to do some things intentionally to undo some things. And can you do them with surgical precision every time in a way that you could justify, uh, you know, up and down every metric? Probably not. But what else do you do at your company that's that precise? What else have you made a major change on that can live up to the standard that critics have around the DEI conversation? Almost nothing. So I think we need to take a leadership role in pushing back on some of the fussiness that comes around when we talk about this. You know, I, if I had a dollar for every white person that comes to me and says, you know, I'm fine with this, but this one time at my wife's company, and then they have a story and it turns out it was 10 years ago and it, the facts are not even that clear. And they've been carrying it around with them for a really long time as a grievance. And when, they, when you take the time to unpack this through a lens of excellence, through a lens of opportunity, you can let some of that baggage go. Now, I think it would be fair to say to someone like me, Andy, you sound like a moderate. You sound like you're apologizing for sins that are not forgivable. You sound like you're letting people down easy. Um, it's not your right as a white man to walk into the diversity conversation and be so be so um, kid gloves on people uh, who are in positions of power in a country that has such a wealth gap and a capital gap and an education gap and on and on. Um, I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. I believe in meeting people where they are and being rigorous and really helping people unlock their potential. So in the middle of that bell curve, we all, I'm trying to push folks to the front. I'm actually not in the business of trying to get you out on the Ben and Jerry's leading edge. You know, that's a different, that's a different process. But I'm trying to push us from the back of that big bell to the front of that big bell. And we're mostly in that bell. So here's the last key term I wanna tell you about. It's just excellence. You cannot aspire to excellence as a company in 2021 on the planet earth if DEI is not well-defined and, and resourced and has benchmarks and goals and timelines in your organization, game over. Went from nice to have to must have somewhere in the last couple of years, but took a pretty sharp turn in the last 15 months. You can't. What, and what we're talking about is embracing that even if you don't fully understand it. Dr. King said something that CEOs probably don't much go for, which is that faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the staircase. It's not exactly something that Peter Drucker um, you know, would have put, put on the board for business quotes, but I truly believe that as a CEO, you either understand it or you have faith that even though you don't, you are surrounding yourself with the team and the tools to do it anyway. Um, and I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna pull any punches on that. So that's how I like to set this all up. Everybody still with me? All right. Um, so what is the business case for DEI excellence and how do we make it in our own shop? I'm gonna put, some pretty generic generalizations out there that you could have found on Google and saved yourself a little time of sitting here with me. But why I'm gonna give them to you now is I wanna then go a little bit into my method when I'm working with companies of, of how to define it for themselves. Um, as Gloria knows, who's here, my business partner in, in Conscious Customers, we won't really work with a company that's not willing to start with the word why. And we've already had a couple of exceptions that we made and we kicked ourselves for it because halfway into the work, there was not a consensus about why we were doing it in the first place. And we said, see, you were so smarty pants that you wanted to skip the why, you can't. 
you have to start by defining it. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of how I like to do it. But first, these are extremely familiar bullets to anyone who's spent some time on this. Diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams. I'm gonna give you the caveat that's not there. If you do the work of inclusion and activation and optimization of your teams, just throwing a bunch of people in a canoe does nothing unless you give them the paddle and lessons. And if they don't speak the same language, then some sort of a system for communicating. We know that already. That is not about racism in America or politics or Professor Kendi. That is called just basic logic. Of course, the, the presence of a different person does not produce the outperformance. It takes work. It's not self-executing. However, when you do put it together, if you're running a bank in Rhode Island right now, and the fastest growing demographic is Latinos and you don't have any on your team, how are you planning on being the bank of the fastest growing segment of the economy that is starting more businesses than anyone else? Seriously, you think you can do it without having Latinos on your team or people who are not Latinos who understand Latino culture? I'm impressed. You can't. But just bringing them on to the same bank that's been there for 150 years without examining anything about itself, not going to work. can save you a lot of time. Not going to work. You've got to prepare the soil. You've got to prepare people. And probably going through change like this, like any other big change you've done in your business, some people aren't going to want to come along for the ride and are going to go. Some people are gonna surprise you and rise to the challenge and some people are already there and been waiting for you to get there. Um, is there a way to make these changes without it changing? No, that's the answer. That's the long answer, nope. So diverse teams outperform for a couple of reasons. One is the dynamism because they bring different things to the table for, around a project, different ways of working, thinking, different life experiences. Second is because they have different networks for business development, for talent acquisition. One of the things that's killing companies in America right now in terms of diverse recruiting is employee referral bonuses. Half the Swarthmore tennis team ends up all working together at a company because uh, you get 3,500 bucks for referring a, a qualified candidate. And, um, that's a good thing, rewarding people, bringing in quality. But when you start out with a homogeneous group and you pay people to bring in their friends, you get a more homogeneous group. You just get a bigger one. And it might be really good. It's not to say that, they're, that you're getting junk. You're getting great people. But you can't get diversity if you take a homogeneous group and you empower them financially to bring their friends. Because American white people don't have professional friends in large numbers who aren't just like them. And I didn't bring the data nugget to show you that that's true, but most of the time it actually is. All right, what else is in the, in the business case? Um, your key stakeholders wanna see it. We're gonna spend a lot of time on that in a moment. Um, present and future employees, investors, regulators, customers, your supply chain, communities where you're operating, they wanna see it and they wanna see it more than ever. By the way, they already did wanna see it before 2020. They really did. The data is there, especially younger people, especially people who live closer to cities, especially people with higher levels of education. I'm not sure why, but that's America. Uh, but boy, do they want it now. Um, and finally, the risk of inaction outweighs the risk of action. For those that are terrified, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't want to do anything. Right now, it's flipped. It's totally flipped. The risk of inaction is outweighing the risk of action. And I'm taking that from conversations in publicly traded companies and family businesses. Um, and it isn't coming from like one sort of type. You know, again, we are not, this is not about Ben and Jerry's. Um, this is about us. So a few more um, dives into the business case. This is just another uh, BCG study from a few years ago. There's the McKinsey one, everyone has their study. Um, you can refute it in the data, but there's quite a lot of indication uh, in this economy that you can get um, innovation in revenue by having an effectively diverse leadership team in a company. 
Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the um, the debate on that, but because I really want to go into this. This is my bread and butter. I live in this chart, um, and my clients do too. You're in the middle. Um, your DEI perspective. Now we could be doing this on strategy on any topic, and I've done it. Um, you know, my work in Emblem is not just with the DEI topic, although it's candidly what I feel the most excited about doing. But you could do this with climate change. You could do this with immigration issues. You could do this with even just business uh, competitiveness issues that are that are nothing to do with social issues. But here's the here's what it's it's called a stakeholder map. You put yourself in the middle. What's your vision? And what are your values as a company? If you don't know them, that's a bigger problem. We can work on that. But once you know them, you put it in the middle. Now, you get a big vote in the in the in the path the company is going to take. Am I right? But you don't have the only vote. So who are the other voters? They're all around you in a circle here: investors, employees, customers. As I mentioned, industry, community, government, regulators. So, for example. Um, you may adopt, let's, let's be contrarian for a second. You may adopt a really DEI first approach and your investors are calling you and saying, what happened to profits first? Um, that is a negotiation to be had. You need to talk to that investor and say, look, this is a strategic priority and here's the reason. Um, this is not a departure from delivering the return that we're trying to. This is in fact about getting to that return. Um, same thing with, with each of these around the circle. And I want to show you some of them here. These are just pulled from the headlines, but let's talk about employees first. Great data out there about age and how much people value diversity. As a Gen Xer, I feel a little bit erased these days because I thought we were pretty interested in this too, but we sort of don't exist anymore um, in the popular conversation. We're sort of, sort of caught between the boomers and and millennials and we'll have our day, we'll have our day, but um, it's, it's a really big priority. The data for younger people in the job market and, 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 and prioritizing it is very compelling. Again, um, jot these down or screenshot them and you can go read the, read the reports, Deloitte millennial survey. Again, look, all these dates are before 2020. There's some new stuff coming out too, but I don't, I don't love it because it's so heated up by the moment in American um, temperature right now. And I don't trust that. Um, so I'm showing you stuff from a couple of years ago for a reason. 47% um, of millennials are actively looking for diversity inclusion when sizing up potential employers. And by the way, disproportionately, that's going to include white people. So it's actually quite interesting. This is not just about you can't hire black employees, you can't be an employer of choice for diverse talent without this. It's actually playing out across uh, even in the major quote unquote majority population. What about investors? There is a wave of shareholder activism going on right now in Wall Street that's prompted by everything from the murder of George Floyd to uh, the way that the COVID pandemic played out. Um, but, it, but it's complex. It includes a lot of things. And um, there is a call for everything from a DEI report to what some are calling a racial equity audit. A, a team that I'm a part of is actually in a discussion with one of the largest Wall Street banks, one of the largest financial institutions on the planet about how to plan a racial equity audit for the entire company trillions of dollars of assets under management. Um, and uh, they want to know, how are we doing? Where are we doing well? Where are we a part of the problem? It's happening in uh, all different kinds of environments. Some of it is being driven specifically by capital in the, in the case of investors. All of you have different structures. But when you have family offices and pension funds behind private equity money or behind venture capital or angel investors, um, you have even more pressure. It's not like, oh, it's just public companies because they're shareholder activists. Um, you may have even more uh, pressure uh, coming through just the way that uh, climate change got pushed by the California uh, Public Employee Pension Fund, for example. 
uh, but people are really asking and it, it, it's coming from your money. And frankly, what's interesting about that is that there's a lot of money now out there. So um, we're involved, for example, with a real estate project that needs to raise between four and 500 million for a project. And they are specifically seeking uh, money that wants a high performance on diversity because the project, although it's aggressively a market rate project and a commercially viable project, has been intentionally done in a way that includes a lot of diverse suppliers and vendors that's creating a lot of amenities and um, opportunities that are, that are not normal yet in commercial real estate. And they think they'll have a lot more flexibility if the money is uh, smart money with regard to the um, agenda that they have. But it is not concessionary investment. It is not people that are saying, we want to invest in your building and we don't mind that it's probably not going to, going to generate a return. That is not what I'm talking about. I am not uh at all saying that these are people who don't want to make a buck what they're saying is they want to place their money somewhere where there is a plan around these topics if your company touches europe you already know um but the reporting obligations in the uk are totally different than they are here um in with regard to pay and gender uh and trigger a lot and nasdaq is doing um a really big push right now uh, to uh, require disclosure um, in the boardroom. The SEC has been looking at disclosures and has a whole uh, pile of stuff already drafted that they are currently testing to see what kind of requirements they can impose on companies that they reach. So it's very much about government as well. Um, communities, another stakeholder. Um, all of your companies try and do a little help for the community and, and be, be connected and, and be, be generous when you can. It's becoming a higher leverage situation um, with DEI. How are we not only doing it, but how are we communicating it? And how are we connected and a part of the success story of the city that we're in or the town we're in that's trying to do this too? Supply chain's a big one. Where do your suppliers... Um, show up in this conversation. Um, what, uh, what I am seeing and what, what is being uh, documented quite widely in the business community is that you will be asked uh, more and more and more by your customer, by your B2B customer about your supply chain, um, about um, who's making the stuff that goes in your stuff. And we're working with biotech companies uh, right now around everything from partners in drug development to where they get the plaques and snacks in the office um, because they have a sense that uh, they need a good answer to the question, but also because they're understanding in conversation with us that we're trying to change the culture. We're trying to do something that's measurable impact that can you know, inure to making us uh, a powerful part of the world. And yes, that can help us attract and retain clients. Uh, and attract and retain talent uh, and all the other things as well. But um, so here's where I wanted to go with this. Um, and I, um, I really want to um, focus you in on sort of what can you do? These are my P's, all right? Now this is, this is a little bit of me giving uh, the finger to uh, a marketing man management class I took in college because I mostly took all those other classes that are kind of useless now, you know, trying to talk about business. Uh, I took one business class and they had the four P's of marketing and I immediately rolled my eyes because I was so superior to the little cliches that they have in, in you know, in the class that, that to get you to remember stuff. So partially I did this because it makes me laugh at how obnoxious I was um, at, at that point. Um, these are my P's about the span of control that you have with regard to, frankly, doing anything deliberate or intentional. But let's stay on our topic with diversity. I think this year, maybe even today, before you have dinner, you ought to be able to say, in terms of DEI, um, what is um, my desire? Forget about what's our approach, what's our strategy, forget it. We'll get there. What is my desire 
in terms of the purpose of our company. Why do we even exist? What do we do in the world? And how does it touch this conversation? It doesn't have to be the first thing you do, but a drug company has to get to it. Uh, you know, a moving company has to get to it. A logistics company has to get to it. How are we connected to it in terms of our purpose and why we're even here? What about the people you employ? What are the policies that are, that are in play at your workplace? What's your approach to procurement? How do you choose partners and what do you expect of them? And what's your presence in the community? Those are the easy ones. Sorry, they're really hard. But those are really the, those are the table stakes ones that I would wanna be working on with you right away. What I would put on page two, but really get to it quickly. What are the products that we offer? What are we even in the business of making here? If it's, if it's um, securitized, chopped up synthetic mortgages, I think you probably have to have a conversation about whether you're producing something that's good for a diverse, healthy America. Uh, turned out it wasn't. Um, there are other things now. Can you sit at, this is my favorite, uh, my favorite, I don't know, sort of eye roll line is, can you sit at Philip Morris and talk about products if you were having this discussion about health, it's a little weird. I mean, we make cigarettes, you know, can we have it? Can we do it in a way that's healthy? But um, first of all, we don't all make cigarettes. And second of all, yeah, whatever you make, it can be made with a consciousness about the diversity and the urgency of equity and inclusion in the world around you and in the expectations of your stakeholders. So you can look at your products and services that you offer through this lens. And that's a lot of fun. That's a really interesting way to, to think about it. We did a lot of work with WeWork around how can they create these urban centers of collaboration with all these companies and have it feel like it's a place for everybody and not just for kind of the, the cliche white uh, urban success story um, uh, in the professional um, downtown of, of many cities. And they had to look at what they were offering in terms of products. You know, what kinds of settings are they opening to people? What kinds of opportunities are they even creating? And that's their product is space. Profits, um, how much is enough? Who shares in it? Um, who has a piece of the action uh, in terms of your employees? Um, could be a powerful way of expressing, again, your values and the values your stakeholders expect of you how you think about things like employee ownership um, and about, um, again, the financial, uh, the most significant financial purpose of the company, right? Generating a profit. Public policy, quick story about a bank that I'm talking to. They said, well, if a lot of immigrants don't want to bank with us because they don't want to bank anywhere, it's because of cultural reasons and, and, and I'm learning about them. There's also a lot of fear of the government. If my money's in a bank and I'm deported or someone in my uh, family is, is scrutinized uh, for their immigration status, how do I get my money? So is, there, is the banking industry in, interested in going to Congress and saying, whatever you do, you can't use uh, their bank accounts as leverage in your immigration policy. If, if um, there were clearer policy around that, there would be a measurable increase in the utilization of banks in the United States, an enormous measurable increase in the utilization of banks. That is in somebody's business interest. I don't know if it's on the US Chamber of Commerce agenda. Larry O'Toole, uh, who's with us today, and I have done a lot of work on immigration issues. Again, public policy. Is it good for business that the local cops might turn people over to uh, federal authorities uh, when they uh, encounter them, you know, um, jaywalking? Uh, is that good for business? Um, those are pretty spicy topics around immigration, and yet there's nothing more fundamental in a country that's labor constrained and try and, and dramatically changing with demographics, then who's here? Um, so who speaks for you on public policy? Um, who says what um, out of your company um, and, and when? 
Um, look, business people love to say, oh, we don't touch it. But frankly, I'm gonna call BS on that because when you're quiet, there are chambers of commerce lining the halls of every legislative body in America 24 seven. So the whole, oh, we don't touch it. Uh, yeah, you're protecting your brand, but believe me, you are funding a ton of public policy work. And how does that connect to DEI? Just a question, but are you willing to ask it? And then finally, path forward. Just how are you visioning the company? How are you visioning your definition of success? And how does it connect to DEI? So finally, um, and I'm gonna stop there so we can go and discuss any of these topics. What's the secret sauce for the big high price consultant, you know, uh, to roll in and, and uh, put a hand in, in your pocket and, and, and work with you? It's so amazing to me how simple this is. And, and um, I don't know how to think about it any other way. Baseline, benchmark, action plan, execute. Where are you now in each of those P's? Pick one, people. Um, where are you now in terms of the people who work for you, you know, in terms of diversity? We talk about it, figure it out. We clear it to baseline. We have this many people in these levels of jobs and this, you know, this many people are women and this many people are people of color or whatever. What do you want to become? We base that on what? What do you usually benchmark against? The competition, your own, your investors' expectations. I mean, that's not new to you. Benchmarking, that's not new. Baselining and benchmarking. And then the third one is what do we need to succeed? I can't find black talent. Everyone wants me to have more African-American people here and I can't find them. Okay, great. You just identified a problem. Save me the speech about the fact that they don't exist or that your sister once had a bad experience at her company. You just identified a problem. Let's create a solution. There is a world of best practices out there. Some of them are different than you've ever tried before. That's because you haven't tried them before. Some of them have not always worked. There's a really famous one called the Rooney Rule. Let me get another show of hands. Anyone heard the Rooney Rule before? That expression? I can't see everyone because of the way the screen is for me. Uh, Art Rooney owns the Pittsburgh Steelers. The National Football League uh, some years ago determined that it was really embarrassing and, and problematic that there were no black head coaches. And there were really almost no black uh, senior coaches on teams, whether they call it coordinators or whatever. So Art Rooney of the Steelers um, really um, informed and advised by a partner of mine, um, Cyrus, um, is the um, is the guru for the NFL on uh, on this topic and, and other topics said um, Rooney rule was when you do a final pool of, uh, of candidates that fly into Pittsburgh to um, interview, there has to be at least one of them who's not white. Now they certainly didn't say it had to be a woman that that hadn't hit the NFL yet, but in the referee ranks, they are starting to do that. And in the develop player development and personnel staffs in the, in, in professional sports, they are focusing intensely on women where they have blown it. There's an Olympic gold medal hockey uh, player from Massachusetts. She was the captain of the Olympic team last year. She just got hired by the New Jersey Devils. Oh my God, do you think women have skill sets that would work inside of a hockey organization in terms of player development when you get a bunch of 20 year old Canadian kids dumped with a with million dollars in their lap and have to make a career for themselves? Of course they need women in a hockey team but it never thought about it, not once before, pretty, pretty damn recently. So um, the Rooney rule was supposed to secure a, 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 an applicant pool. The army's done it for years. Uh, Colin Powell writes that every time he ever got a promotion, he was only included in the candidate pool because in the army, you cannot certify a candidate pool and then do a, a hire until you can certify that it's diverse. And every time he was the last one added and every time he got the promotion because he was the best. Now, the Rooney rule failed. It didn't work. It's been studied by social science. Uh, and the conclusion is that it, it's now uh, clear that you need double Rooney. So in a pool of candidates out of the finalists, you need two to be either a woman and or a person of color. Doesn't matter if the woman is a person of color according to the studies. 
And when that happens in, in a final applicant pool, something changes in the alchemy, not just the odds, but the alchemy of the process that ends up producing a higher yield of diverse candidates. I'm not here to tell you that I um, think you need to do that. I'm just saying that's an example of a technical adjustment, a technical adjustment to a process that is not hoping, wishing, posting on idealist with better adjectives. It's a technical adjustment in a category. Um, it's a best practice that you might have adopted in your benchmarking, you know, to get to your benchmarking. Um, so that's what I do with, 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 with um, advice on this stuff is I say baseline benchmark, action plan, execute. And the, the, um, the devil's in the details. There are best practices in every one of these um, categories in every one of these P's. There are best practices to borrow and um, it's much more expensive to not do it than it is to try to you know, put a team together to do it. Um, so that's what I wanted to present to you in terms of content today. Um, as we think about a discussion, these are the questions that I have in mind um, for all of us. And then I wanna just leave it open for a discussion, for questions, certainly direct questions to me and hold me accountable for what I've put out there and to explain it better. Um, but then I want everybody to reflect a little bit, maybe even just take a minute now before we start talking. Um, what's your personal DEI journey so far? I just heard a story of a uh, executive in, a, in an investment company who heard about a deal that was being done by a partner and, and said, really? I wouldn't even let my wife get out of the car in that neighborhood. That is how off his personal DEI journey is from the changes that are happening in the, in the business environment, uh, in the geography that he's placed in. Um, he better not say that out loud. It's already been repeated. It got to me. Um, but that is how out of touch he is with uh, where his partners are looking at deals and opportunities. And he want, and he needs, if he needs everywhere that they look to feel like the places he's comfortable, he's, he's circumscribing a pretty small spot in, in this planet. So where are you on your personal journey? You know, a lot of people of means in my life have been to Soweto on their South Africa trip for a day and took great pictures of poverty, but they've never been in most parts of, of Roxbury and Dorchester, or, and they've never been to, to Lawrence but they can tell you all about the mountain yards in Vietnam and, and who had no teeth uh, and were, you know, were illiterate. You know, do we even have exposure to profoundly different life stories to people who have been um, outside of, you know, some of the great privilege that each of us has had? Um, have you ever worked closely with someone who was really truly different from you? Have you ever had a boss or a mentor who was, um, what's next for you in terms of pushing your own ability to understand this personally? Um, and about what about your company? What's been the journey? Are you satisfied? Um, and, uh, you know, do you feel like you have what you need? You know, there's, forming the intent is not really gonna get you very far, but do you have the team in place? you have the tools you need um, to meet the challenge. So that's, that's my song. Um, and um, I can tell you more about what we do, um, but this isn't a commercial. This is a chance for you guys to dive in and, and share some experience and let's see if we can help each other out. Andy, can I, can I jump in just with, you, you started with definitions and it's, it's both foundational, but it also defines scope. Um, and this is one that, you know, we're, we're at the beginning and, and we may be at the beginning of our DEI journey for a long time. Um, Can you just tell me who's talking? Cause I'm, I'm just looking at the screen and I'm a little kid. My apologies. Um, no I've got a, I've got a lower back issue. So I've been, oh, uh, I've been icing and you don't want to see me making faces that aren't related to your. Turn off, content. turn it off. I just didn't even see your name on it. Okay, so Jake, wait. Tell us your company first and what you do, and then sure. then go ahead. So there, there it is in the the ten dollar uh, uh, background, fake background there. So Saldara Medical, 
we're a, an incubator accelerator up here in New Hampshire. Um, we've got off offices in some other places as well. Um, and we are uh, always looking for new and interesting medical innovation, primarily in therapeutics, in the academy usually, and then we do preclinical development. And so we've been doing this for, uh, it's our 13th year now. And um, if, if I had more time, uh, I would see Scott every month and uh, he's been very, very kind. And this was a topic I could not um, be too busy to attend. So um, thank you for, for the invitation, Scott, and the content, Andy. Um, so the, the question stems from the, the definition of diversity where you, you sort of set up two ends of the, the spectrum as a straw men. You did that intentionally, but it's in between that I think is where there's some real value. And so we have a, a, a race diversity issue in this country. We have a gender diversity issue in this country. We also have a socioeconomic diversity issues in the country, educational access to all of the aforementioned. Um, and my gut says that adding more categories to the definition of diversity necessarily dilutes the most important problems. My gut says the most important problems are probably starting with race, moving to gender, and then there are the other things. Um, but how do, how of the most successful organizations that you've been counseling dealing with that? And, and how do you recommend people think about scoping this? Because that, if you don't scope it from the beginning, then it, you know what happens. That's a great um, place to take us. I'm going to answer it only on the condition that others can answer it too after me, because otherwise it wouldn't be a Scott Lewis CEO roundtable event. Um, so uh, he already told me uh, a lot about what happens in the roundtables, and I know we're here for each other's uh, ideas. So that, um, in that spirit, I couldn't agree more that, that there, the elephant in the room has to be you know, the elephant in the room. And it, for everyone, it's different. Um, but for all of us, it is the experience of African Americans and people who are in traditionally profoundly disadvantaged, intentionally excluded categories. And that is race and gender in this country. There is no debating that on a statistical basis. However, and when you look at diversity um, without defining that and protecting that, you do dilute it. Um, for example, it, what we don't counsel clients to do, what we don't, I was going to say what we don't let them do, but that's, you know, um, what we don't want them to do is to just say, like, we have 18% diverse managers. Doesn't tell me anything. I don't, that number is hiding something. And usually what it means is we have 3% African American, a large number of white women. And then we have South Asian uh, um, professionals, all of whom are disproportionately succeeding in America. And, and by the way, add a ton of certain kinds of diversity to the culture that you have so good for you, but you've lost in the sauce some really important strategic and moral and uh, uh, cultural imperatives. So even when you expand it and really wanna have other groups uh, represented, we advise you always have to measure around Black, African-American, Latino, and women. I would say this, however, um, there is a huge difference between a third generation Chinese American and a refugee from, from Mumbai. Um, you know, and so when one says Asian, what is one talking about? Well, you could say, well, there's a difference between a, th a third generation doctor who's Black and a you know, uh, and a person who's coming out straight out of a, you know, a family where no one's ever gone to college. Yep, all of that's true. But in this country, we look, when we look at African-American experience through data and through a collective lens, which is incredibly imperfect, we have, we have um, patterns that you can't ignore and we have responsibility because of law and business practices that we can't ignore. So I still think for me, it all starts with the Black experience, uh, and it start, all starts with the Latino, Latinx experience and the women experience, but it goes outside of that pretty quickly. Um, if you're, uh, and, and also the demographic patterns are regional. 
um, there's a huge population of Portuguese speaking people in New England that have always been kept slightly outside of the mainstream. And if, if you're in an area, particularly Southern New England, and don't have an understanding of what that history is and what's going on there, you're missing the boat. Um, and your stakeholders are gonna begin to ask you about it. Um, so that's, it's something I wanna point out. I also wanna just say that um, the critical issue is the rigor of, of finding the why and finding the definition of diversity. It's not, oh, what did Andy, you know, what does Andy think? Or, you know, what is, what is um, this publication or that publication telling us? If you get the people that matter to your company together in a room and have a good discussion about it, you won't miss it. You know, if you're in a drug company and you're not aware of the way that African-American people have been excluded from trials, have been underserved in disease categories that are uh, for which there are no imminent therapies, um, even though there are millions of people who need them. You don't need a ton of uh, analysis to know that you've got to address that as a priority. Andy, I would like to um, just kind of jump in. So my name is Mel Jones and I'm in Maryland. I'm at the Maryland Food Bank. Um, prior to coming here, and I'm in a program management position here. Uh, prior to coming here, I was the CEO of a, a hunger relief organization in Houston, Texas. Um, I've spent 20 years in hunger relief and poverty issues, mainly working in disaster space uh, after Hurricane Katrina, then Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Rita. Uh, hurricanes seem to follow me in my life. Um, the DEI space has been become even more critically important to me over probably the last 10 years. Uh, to the point where I kind of weaned back to more mid-management to take on a personal uh, opportunity to help educate our communities, mainly underserved communities, of what this means. Because I still find a lot of our conversations and topics surround around fixing, fixing it. Um, fixing it for communities who are disenfranchised, who do not necessarily even understand of the ramifications of how it's all coming together and how to get back into a space of advancement uh, and even survival. So my, my why is to educate myself to the fullest capacity to be able to uh, transfer that knowledge to communities who are underserved um, and to be able to work within organizations like the one that I'm in to bring the voice that is always bringing civil conversation, but also confrontational conversation to the forefront, because a lot of times we don't want to push the button or, or uh, challenge the normal or speak too hard. Um, but we're in a time where it's mainly for communities um, of color like mine um, and the things that I see that it's an all out fight for survival. And so that's my why. I just want to give that space to breathe. When we're talking about a fight for survival, um, it pulls ahead. There's so many nuances within our diverse country that are worthy of our attention. But um, when you hear that the net worth of a black family in Boston, Massachusetts is $8, and the median net worth of a white family in Boston, Massachusetts is 247000 um, you know, they didn't volunteer for it to be that way. We have to deal with that. And the question is, yeah, yeah, but I run like a, you know, a, a medical device company, you know, in the suburbs and we're sort of, we had a bad year last year. Like, what do you want me to do again? <laughs> you know, um, what I'm trying to say is don't leave it to the province of your generous charitable giving. Think about, again, with those P's, that I gave you and with baseline benchmark action plan. Think about where in your business, inside the four corners, you touch this. It could be as simple as the challenge I would give you all. I'm gonna throw down my glove on trivia right now. Don't order any fleece vests with your logo on them, please, without thinking about who the supplier is. There's amazing small businesses owned by black people in, this, in the 617. Uh, and all over the country, but I, I know a bunch of them near Boston too. 
you let the let them make the, the brilliant small businesses that can make all your logo gear you know because you, you might be a drug manufacturer saying like i can't find a I, I can't find an African-American, you know, drug manufacturing subcontractor. Okay, maybe you can't. First of all, we can help you because there are some, but you don't need to order the, the swag for your next trade show from Amazon without, I like Amazon, but without regard for who they're getting it from. Pick someone that you want to pick, you know? If you're focusing on breast cancer, then make it women, you know? But be aligned, be intentional. I, I have a cliche you know, tagline, but when you align your vision and your values in business, you can get distinction, impact, and advantage. I, Andy, I, I, this all speaks to something that you said in an earlier conversation that, uh, that we had. And, and I, said, I said, you know, I don't know how to increase the level of diversity in the CEO roundtable. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you said something about, well, where are you fishing? And, and I realized I'm, I'm casting into the same brook. I'm, I'm fishing in the, in the same pond all the time. And for this event, um, I, I consciously tried to fish in a different pond. And I, I don't know how, how well that worked out, but we've got a little more diversity than we had in some of the other events. Um, so I, that, that metaphor st stuck with me. And um, I see a hand up and I, I, I'm afraid I don't know C. Nair, uh, but if you'd like to ask your question uh, and introduce yourself, that would be great. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, what a wonderful conversation. I wanted to just share that, um, you know, I have been doing this for three decades and it's been um, a very kind of uh, heartwarming and oftentimes heartrending to see the evolution of this space. Um, and long story short, I wanted to ask um, the role um, of true authentic in, you know, engagement in this space um, must um, exceed the business case uh, in a little bit, because as you said, uh, people don't have within that circle, you know, the uh, diversity of, of this great land. Um, and also perhaps the history and um, all those relevant areas weren't really um, covered so, so much. Um, and so I'm curious to know any fault lines um, in actual implementation of the business case, uh, what you might have found, what are some of the um, spaces, where is it going next? What, what is the next iteration in this evolution that you are seeing? Um, and I, I see it in the heart space. I, I think in, in true connection, exactly what you were saying, the nuances are, are so many. Um, to factor in from many communities that are all coming to the fore together um, and being able to parse um, the real need and where justice can truly be served, it does take a, a lot of discernment and that takes time and time often conflicts directly with, with the speed of business that we normally run at. So I have found that um, slowing it down uh, creating that space for that in the design um, is is essential for for any true moving the needle. So I'm curious to know if your thoughts on that. Um, I'll share some, but then I want to hear others. Um, it, where's the opportunity to to really break free and and create success here? Um, one is I would say you might find this to be a cop out. I would say look to how to where innovation models for innovation in other parts of your business. I only talk about Jim Collins because it's one of the only business books that I ever really, really just took on board and never let go of was, was good to great. But when you look at, you know, what helps an entity move forward, it's not that different necessarily with this. It's deliberate techniques that have been shown to work. And there are some deliberate red flags like my favorite one that he talks about that doesn't work is a charismatic leader that it can be a distraction and it can silence people 
Um, the, there's a great one that he talks about with, with mini mills and the steel industry of creating, you know, pilots and lab programs um, and giving innovation the space to grow kind of on a different balance sheet or in a separate space within the company. Those sorts of traditional business impulses are, are really, really relevant here. And you know them. Um, this isn't any different. It doesn't mean that that's all there is to this. There's something much bigger and more profound, in my opinion, that has to do with really letting it affect you, really being affected by, as Mel generously shared, um, the fact that it's a, there are people struggling for survival all around you. Be profoundly affected by that. Be able to reckon with your privilege. I'll tell you one thing that's happened in the last six months is there's a huge amount of capital flowing to black and brown founders and black and brown initiatives in, in all sectors. You know what I'm not hearing? That anybody is skipping meals because of it. You know, nobody is saying, God, well, all right, we won't have lunch for the next six months because we're going to allocate some of our money to that. There is so much excess capital and excess wealth circulating in our economy within a space that's this size. And if we could only make it this size, it all keeps growing. It, it's not zero sum. And you know what? Um, some of that capital is not going to pay out. But so did the same thing happen with some of the capital that you deployed last year. Um, the idea, I'll give you a quote I got out of a, a, a a poor employee is wonderful at a, at a client company. He didn't mean to give me this pearl, but it's going in a book I'm writing on the subject, um, which I was going to call shit white people say, but now I know I kind of have to clean it up. Um, but like we say the dumbest things without meaning, without even realizing. And he said to me, uh, and when we have power and say dumb things and don't challenge ourselves, it, you know, no, we don't have the right anymore. Um, he said, you know, this is a great discussion about our vendors and our suppliers because we've had some really, he said, you know, white privilege is to me is mediocrity. We have so many mediocre consultants that work for this company and no one ever ends their contracts. And he goes, then he goes, so that's why this is so exciting to me because I'm looking forward to finding some of the brilliant and outstanding black and Latino consultants that are out there if you can help us find them. And he didn't even hear it. Did you hear it? Did you hear the shift? He wants to end some of the contracts with mediocre people and go out and find brilliant and extraordinary and exceptional people. Guess who just got screwed? Mediocre black consultants. And I'm laughing because he didn't mean it that way and he's not a bad guy and they're not going to do a dumb thing because we're not going to outlet them. But that is a classic example of what happens. That is a classic example. Now, if, if when they go out and look for consultants that are more diverse, do you think they're gonna have the same standards they've always had or do you think the standards are gonna go up? When they say we couldn't find anybody, we couldn't find anybody, but we're, our starting point is that the ones we've been renewing for years are mediocre. That is how deeply this is in our minds as white people who have privilege and have power. So for me, it starts at the Jim Collins, like tactician, you know, business and, you know, rigor and technique. And it has to start at the aha end of laughing at yourself for being and for saying something as, as dumb as that and like kind of unpacking it. And you know what? Um, this was in my last slide that I got rid of, um, but because I, I was, I said I would say it and I forgot. I think 2020 was a year of tears and reckoning and devastation and, and some words, some words that were really intended to be sincere. 2021 is a year of collaborating uh, generously around taking action and, and doing something about it. 2022 is going to be about naming and shaming. 2022 is going to be the year when people say, I have not seen them change a thing. And you're going to be shoving words down your throat that you put on your website in 2020 and 2021. But right now, um, 
especially with COVID, there's been an extra sort of, there's, um, what do they call it in soccer stoppage time? There's like this, you know that moment, does anybody watch soccer, football? Um, I'll never understand this, I love the game. There's that whole part of the game where nobody knows when it's gonna end. Cause it's like over, right? And then they're like, oh, but it's stoppage time. And everyone's running around and playing, but you don't, the, only the ref knows how many seconds, you know, he has on his watch where they stop for an injury or they stop because the, you know, whatever. We're in stoppage time. We have no idea right now when the country, when, when the stakeholders are going to call bullshit and say like, you've had a year since George Floyd died. You had a year since you did that whole thing on your website. What are you doing? What are you spending on it? What are you taking risks on? Um, what, where is the, where is the action? Where's the humility? Um, where's the collaboration? Um, and, um, but we're in this great time now where everybody's so forgiving. Everybody's like, oh, it's okay. Let's work, let's work on it together. Not next year. Next year, they're going to be pissed. That's a, that's I, a good, I'm, I'm still talking questions, comments. Reactions. Yeah. Tell me I'm out to lunch. I love I love being told I'm missing something because I usually am missing a lot. I, I I'd like to pick up on your comment about uh, if if you like Jim Collins, I think you've done him one up um, because he talked about putting the right people on the bus, and you said you said something about it. It's not about putting the, a bunch of people in a canoe. I think it's much more meaningful to talk about putting the right people in the canoe, because if you got the wrong people in a canoe, it's a lot worse than if you got the wrong people in a bus, because you're going to end up in the water. And if you don't give them a paddle, then they're not doing any good. And I, I, I really like the analogy of, of uh, putting people in a canoe and, and they don't do any good unless you give them a paddle. And so there's the diversity and the, and the inclusion. Um, uh, elements right there you're being teased in the chat for being a canadian um which is really funny because i think i think the implication is that canadians canoe a lot but uh <laughs> you also have to have communication in the um in the canoe right uh love the canadians and love the canoes and also um my dad was a surgeon in vietnam in in the army and he told me that there was humor in the tent you know when bodies were literally smoke coming off them from from burning and i have a holocaust survivor a friend and teacher who told me there was humor in auschwitz and so you know we don't all know each other that well um and i'm white and a man so for me to presume levity in this topic i'm taking a risk and also it's just canada um but we do once we're in trust with this stuff we got to be able to like have a couple yucks because human beings are a trip um, um but i i never mean to do that in a way that diminishes anybody because as mel centered us we're talking about people who are struggling for survival while we're rearranging chairs on you know our on our cruise ships um chi chi lu had a question Hi, yes, Andy. So I'm Chichi Lu. I'm from Masaro Consulting. Um, unfortunately, our founder couldn't be here today, but he was able to forward me the invite. So thank you, Scott, for allowing me to join. I forwarded it to uh, my colleague, Emily, because she's the head of our community. But so Andy, you, you had a lot of excellent points and I think your, your business case absolutely makes sense. I get very excited and passionate about this topic because within Masara Consulting, so we're a management strategy consulting, um, I do deliver on client projects, but additionally, I'm also the head for impact and culture. So I think about a lot about how do we grow as a company? How do we grow this influence in our communities, but also at our client sites, right? Some of the things that I have challenges with and I struggle with is when you talk about the bill, bell curve, right? And you're like, we want to be at the forefront. But what scares me is that half of America or half of the people are behind, right? And that is a tremendous amount of people. So when you say that companies are going out and they're trying to hire diverse talent and you lay out this 
extremely articulate business case, all of the data has been out there. So you had sources from 2016, and like this is not new information, right? It just so happens that last year there were a lot of media attention. But well, I, I guess my question is, what would you say if you lay out this business case and people are like, that's great, but we have other things to focus on, right? We have 100K to invest in an initiative, you know, DEI is something that we definitely should do, but here's something else that we need to get money in the door. How do you, how would you respond to that? Um, first with just recognizing that it's significant and serious and that this is gonna be a, a struggle of my life, of our lifetimes and, and beyond. Um, and that there are people who haven't even been born yet who are gonna suffer because of our, you know, being kind of slow to get this done. Um, and um, second, I would say that um, action is informative, you know, action teaches us. So um, once we've taken a step, we're not the same person anymore. The view uh, is better as you go every step up the mountain, right? And um, uh, again, because of my eclectic background, I bridged to some weird sources, but there's a psychology professor at UMass Amherst who named Erwin Staub, who's actually studying, working with police behavior change right now. And, um, and um, he did a seminal study of rescuers in the Holocaust, uh, people who risked their lives to save people in the middle of a genocide. And he has this incredible takeaway from having studied all of these cases. And he said, they are all people who started with small steps. I know what a cliche, right? Like we already know, you know, that, that you start the journey of a thousand, you know, um, miles starts with this with this with the small step. Um, but um, he has a phrase that says people began with something small and came to see themselves as someone who helps. And there is a transformation that occurs. And that's just agency. So inaction teaches us nothing and exposes us to risk. Action informs us and empowers us and empowers the people around us and attracts people who want action. And so it is not, um, it is not a geometric process. It's an exponential process of growth that you get from action because you're no longer the person who you were at the beginning and you're no longer the company you were at the beginning. That's, that's the meta answer. The more practical answer um, is pressure, stakeholder pressure. Um, capital's gonna have new questions, employees are gonna have new questions, um, government and regulators are gonna have new expectations. It's changing in almost every industry um, and it's only gonna change more quickly. Andy, we're, we're at our time, so um, I'm happy to keep the room open and I'm sure uh, you could hang around a little bit to, uh, to have a, a continued discussion but I'd, I'd like to uh, sort of wrap up the formal uh, part of this, of this thing and uh, recognize Mel for uh, bringing this. Uh, I did have to breathe a little bit when she reminded me that this is a, a matter of survival for a lot of people. And I'd like to tell the story a little bit about uh, 1988 when I took a leadership course and there was a woman in the room um, she was a housewife and a, the only female, and we were solving a problem. Uh, and there were four engineers, a metallurgist and a manager and this woman. And we told her, we got this, we got the solution. She said, but what about, no, no, we got this. And we went out to present that solution and we were all wrong. And she was right. And if we'd listened to her, we would have been a lot less embarrassed because we were really wrapped around the axle. We were really dumb. And that made me realize in the rest of my career, I've always gone into the room and looked for Susan because there's somebody out there whose garden is different than mine, who has a better idea. So to answer your question, Chi Chi, the, the solution to getting money in the door or doing the the imperative thing that has to be done tomorrow might be opening the door a little bit and looking at a diff different 
garden and now I've mixed a bunch of metaphors, but, but the point is that it's that diversity that is fundamental to building a strong team and to having an outcome better than yours, better than mine, better than any individual on the team, the more diverse, the more legs under the stool, the better the solution. And so I, I think I, I, am, I am more than ever convinced that this is part of that solution to every problem is more diversity and giving people a paddle. I love that. So um, thank you all for attending. If you'd like to hang around a little bit and, and continue uh, the discussion, you're welcome to do that uh, for another few minutes. I know uh, everybody's got a, uh, a, a difficult schedule and if you have to jump, that's, that's fine. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Somebody's got a cat. Andy, if you have a minute. Yeah. Um, Gordon Hirschman from uh, Vivonics. We're a small company, like 12 people. We do new medical device innovations, almost entirely with government funding that we have to compete for. And then we try and find a path for them to get commercialized, either by licensing or by spinning something off or by doing it in the back room, you know, bootstrapping wise. Um, and my question to you, I mean, you know, we, we struggle enough to not lose too much money each year. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't have the stakeholder problem because I'm the majority shareholder. I founded the company. Uh, and so other than sort of my wife, who I always think owns half of my shares, you know, I don't, you know, and, and her, her, you know, concern is, are we going bankrupt, you know? Um, so I don't have a big stakeholder. I got to convince the board, you know, I'm the sole board member of the company. But I certainly have the problem of limited resources and the living on the edge in the company and needing to have a good talent for us to succeed. But at the same time, I want to do something. Um, you, you invoke Jim Collins, and I think you, you sort of keyed off a little bit in what you were saying about action, breeding more action, his concept of, of fire bullets than cannonballs. Um, so and I'm asking you, as the, head of a, as the head of a not really profitable 12 person company, you know, I can't afford to hire you as a consultant to do this. Um, like Scott said, I think my heart's in the right place, but I don't know what to do. And I'm asking you, what, what's the what's the first bullet I should fire? What's the you know, if I want to take a baby step because I do, but I have all this pressure on me about running the company successfully. What's the what's the baby step? What can I do? And I I, I have some ideas, but. I'd like to hear from you and then, then maybe I'll sort of tell you. I would go, well, first of all, thank you for the question. And it's not, it's, it's not simple. Um, I think um, you have 12 employees. The first thing that might, you might do is, especially if um, you don't know anything about them, ask them, have a conversation with, a gr with the group that this is important to the Hirschmans and therefore it's important, important to the company. And there are a million complicated questions in the world, but this is important to us. And uh, we're trying to find a, a foothold in it. Are there, is it important to you uh, and why? And um, how do you think it could be demonstrated that it's important to us? Um, you'll probably, now I don't know your company, but if you're in Scott's world, you're a smart and an enlightened and a curious person and you're, you're open to, to other people's points of view, you're going to get magic out of that. That's number one. Number two is um, go back to the slide. If, if you didn't copy it all, we'll send it to you where I put the P's. Look at the, at the first group of P's. It's, it's the stuff that you control. Um, one of the things we have found that's really significant is, um, procurement because it's so tangible. Pop open your expense budget and look at what you spend money on. And then look for the, the stuff that's 
take off take off the table the stuff that's really esoteric and 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 not really relevant and then see if you can find businesses that are black owned latin owned women owned whatever your your uh, focus is that you can be a customer and then feature that business once you like their product and like their service socialize that uh, among either your employees or your friends or you know as part of your story, make them a part of your success. Um, and um, that's, that's a very tangible and sometimes quite small, but at scale, if we were all doing it, you know, we have a real estate client that really scoffed at the notion that they could do it with their operating budget. They're like all the money's in projects. We don't have any, we don't buy anything. And it's like when, when white people who own businesses say we don't buy anything, what they mean is we don't spend more than like two or $3 million a year. That's what they mean by nothing. Um, first thing we did with them was um, they get, they buy a book for their 500 closest friends every year. It goes out with a little letter. Well, now they buy it from a black owned bookstore. And you know what was one of the coolest things they learned? That black owned bookstores, just like other bookstores can do that and can work with a publisher to source it at a reduced cost and have a plate put in it at the plant just like anyone else can. And by the way, maybe they can't because they're not very good, but not because they're black. It's because maybe you picked a bad bookstore or a bookstore that doesn't do that sort of thing. But um, boom, 500 books a year. Uh, so I'm just saying like, pick something really tangible when you think about where your money's going. And then when you think about people, um, it might be hard with 12, but if you do have an internship program, uh, if you do have job openings, uh, anywhere that there's natural flexibility and attrition is the place to focus on how can I bring diversity into the team? You know, I, I want to say something too, because you talked about the not racist versus anti-racist. And, and it, it, this is something I've struggled with my whole life, I think. Um, because there's always this inner conversation that's going on in my head. And I, I don't know that I'm succeeding because honestly, um, the it takes a part of my brain to be anti-racist just to keep me from not being racist. And I don't mean racist in an overt way. Yeah, I know. I mean the kind of racist that if I'm walking down a city street at night and you know there's uh, two black men coming at me, I'm more likely to want to cross the street than if there's two white men. And, and that happens and I have, to, I have to beat it down to not let it compel my actions. You know, so, I mean, there's just so much that we all carry around, so much baggage. But but by admitting it and naming it, you're you're acknowledging it, and that's the beginning. And, and, well, and we have to do that because. Yeah. But, but well, I mean, well, that's most the people point. Don't. Most people are in. Most people are afraid that even if they say that, now they're admitting fault and they're showing vulnerability that'll be used against them, or least things start to unravel. Unconscious bias, by the way, and I speak very carefully when it sounds like I'm speaking for others, but people of color have a ton of unconscious bias about other people of color. You know, there are plenty of black people who also want to cross that street because they have been exposed to the same narratives that you have about what is dangerous and what is not dangerous. And there's people of color, black people who would lie to you about the fact that they do that because they are as shamed by it as you might have been. And then there's people who don't because they're stubbornly trying not to, <laughs> and who are white and who are black. You can't be a human being in America and not be infected with racial bias. You can't be, how could you be? Uh, it's, it's ubiquitous. So you gotta bite you know, the elephant. What do you do? Eat the elephant one bite at a time and all that. And, and um, see who you are after two, three bites and trust your people because they know. They know really I love that about them. asking the people. And I think yeah. that's something for all issues that, that I probably don't do enough. I mean, I was sitting here doing some numbers while you were talking to try and think about my company. And, and you know, there's not a tremendous amount of diversity um, out of those 12 people, you know, that there's, there's, you know, I mean, we're not doing too bad on gender, 
because it's 46% female. But my five person leadership team in the 12 person company is all white men. And, and I don't like that. It wasn't always that way, by the way, but it is now. And, and I'm trying to think about how do I get some different people on, you know, with voices at that level in the company? I'll tell you, um, quick answer is sometimes you have to change the shape of the table um, because some, it isn't like, I was, I, uh, I think in one of the paragraphs about me that I made Scott read, I, I said, I was, I helped start a CEO, a business leadership organization. And um, it's called Alliance for Business Leadership. And it's, it's like, um, it, it's a, it's a good group. It was originally supposed to be a CEO group. And um, interesting, Scott, I didn't think about this as a connection to your question. Um, we had to change it because the, we had this initial meeting of the most progressive people that you could find them tripping over each other to talk about how worldly and inclusive they are. And they were all white men. And we realized that if we were going to be creating an alternative to the chamber of commerce, that was going to be more enlightened, but it was going to be CEOs. It was a non-starter. So on day one, at, not day one, midway through day one, not on pre day one, Midday, midway through day one, we changed it to a senior executives group and we created some sort of a CEO programming track, you know, on a more low key basis. And all of a sudden we were able to tap into more women and more people of color, not enough, but certainly it, with other strategies, you're, you at least now have the opportunity. And so we had to change the shape of the table. If we had stuck by our guns and said, no, it's CEOs. Damn it, we're going to fish this pond till we find one. And it's going to be like, okay, well, look, you know, there's not enough. Even if you got them all, <laughs> then everybody else would be saying, oh, we don't have any CEOs of color. Like, that isn't the, that isn't the problem. The problem is that the way you've defined the group. And so one sometimes has to think of it that way is, is, is um, you know, whatever. So. That's I like that notion of, of uh, changing the shape of the table. Uh, Mel, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, just speak to what Gordon was saying about, you know, the, some biases. And I just want to be, you know, honest in the, in the midst of our climate right now, there are some streets that I will cross. I mean, we have, you know, we, we can't be um, oblivious to the fact that there's hostilities within our communities and there's a lot of hostilities in the African American community, it feels like, you know, this disenfranchisement has led to such poverty and uh, inequities that violence has become part of the fabric. And so, you know, we address that on the, on a daily basis. I address it, you know, within communities, within um, you know, people that we serve here at the food bank. Um, and I think it's just something that we continue to walk through. Um, but I do have you know, biases among other groups as well, because it's some, you know, it's just some places that I don't trust. I'm from New Orleans. I'm, you know, I'm from rural America. Um, there's some streets that I don't want to go down in, in late at night because I don't know if my car stopped, whether or not I will be safe to come out of there. And that's in, you know, rural Louisiana. Um, so I think it's just across the board. We're working through a lot of different issues. Um, being a CEO previously in a room in Houston, a lot of times I was the only African-American female in that room and um, I had to learn how to navigate through, you know, a variety of crowds. But at the end game, um, you know, I'm glad to see where we are. We're, we're pushing action. We're pushing movement, even in the Feeding America Network. If you look at hunger relief organizations across the country, many of the heads of those organizations are uh, not people of color, but the communities that serve are uh, black and brown people across the United States. Um, so we have a lot of changes um, that need to happen. We have a lot of action that needs to, to continually be in movement. And I just, you know, I wanna honor the fact that you recognize it and wanna do something different. I love the idea of internships and, um, you know, giving uh, persons of color opportunity to be at the table because a lot of things that I didn't learn early in my career was because I was never brought to that table until it was you know where I, I didn't know what I didn't know so now I'm on the extreme path of you know intentional learning I'm intentional about all the actions that I take uh, but giving us somebody an opportunity to be part of your team and to be learned up uh, in a way that they may not know some of those things I think is a great way to start as well 
So thank you. Thank you, Mel. More wisdom. Um, uh, uh, something that Mel alluded to that I just want to name that I didn't in this particular presentation is social capital. Um, you don't get to be Gordon Hirschman, owner of his own company, without having some social capital you've accumulated over the years. And um, I don't know you yet, but I'm I'm excited about your your courage and your your humility around the topic. But I would submit that you probably have access to people that other people don't in some category through some network or some life experience. And I think we undervalue that. I'll give you an example of I have a friend whose company paves parking lots, you know, striping and uh, seal coating. Uh, they're called city seal coating out of Lawrence, Mass. Um, and uh, I actually know people who own parking lots. Isn't that a thing? <laughs> you know, think about it, like, that's exotic in the world. Like if there's a spectrum, right? Like what's the percentage of people who know people who own parking lots, right? It's like right over here, right? Never mind own their own, have their own driveway. That pulls us out to about here on this spectrum, right? In the world, I can help him. <laughs> and he hires people of color. He has, he's raising a family that's a family, you know, they're, they're a family of color. He has a, a commitment to things that I believe in, including by the way, excellence and disruption of a shitty old industry. Um, not like, not unlike Larry O'Toole, who looked at an industry and said it can be done better. You don't even have to give a deep discount. You you can charge what you deserve by doing it better and right and and solving a problem for people. So that's Keith, right? So that's table stakes for me. Like the cake's got to be good, right? But then I'm like, oh my god, he's hiring ex felons, you know, and training them into a, a career path. He's this, he's that, whatever. I got him paving parking lot for people who own park. I know who own parking lots. I get a kick in the, I get such a kick out of that. And I don't need anything from Keith, but you know what? He's already helping me with God knows how many things because we became friends. I'm just saying like, you don't, that's big enough, right? Like that's big enough right there. Probably, probably you have something similar in your life, you know? And if you don't, another fun thing, and Scott for the round table too, there are some cool networks that are more diverse of entrepreneurs of color and they're popping up more and more all over the place. And wherever your zip code is, I'm happy to help connect you. But becoming a mentor in one of those environments or a judge at like a pitch contest or a shark tank type of thing, or, um, or even an advisor, you know, then, then you'll meet them and you'll get you always, damn it. It's such a, thing the white guys always benefit from this more than anybody because you'll be saying to me god Andy, it was really meaningful i'm so grateful damn it even when we try to do something for someone else we get more out of it look how much joy i'm getting from even just talking about it it's like there's nothing concessionary about me choosing to do this work i couldn't do anything else i love it you know i'm not like oh i for for the good of humanity, I said no to another hedge fund that really wanted to, to have me in. I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, so put, you know, you have oars that are in social capital that you could put, or paddles, sorry, we're in a canoe, you know, put them in the water. Right. Grateful, Scott, I'm going to bounce and um, promise to be available. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank offline, you. Offline, but. And thank nice you all meeting you, Mel. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.